Good evening, good evening, and welcome to Ladies' Night. Ladies' Night introducing, as always, the dynamic duo of Mommy Activist and Lady Tori of Power 904. And today we put a new perspective on, I want to say, on making lemonade. You know how they say when life throws you lemons, gives you lemons, you make lemonade? This is an inspiration to everyone. And after reading this bio, I have to say in the beginning, I have a whole different respect for women in the military you know we all we all want to give people in the military a big up because they they give their life i mean even if it's three years or whatever 20 you know you give your life to protect us to help the citizens you know here in america and also other countries i mean we we help all you know but you really really do give your life so a woman's tenacity is the best description of all of it with captain leslie smith Fourth of July, red, white, and blue, and this is the best. Anybody knows anybody in military, you have to give them a big up. Not just for the Fourth of July, but for every day. Once you hear this, I'm sure you will talk about a woman's tenacity. Today we have Captain Leslie Nicole Smith, a retired Army captain, graduated from Marymount University in Arlington, Virginia, with a degree in communications, public relations. She received her commission from the Army ROTC program at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. Leslie was assigned to nuclear, biological, and later attended Army Defense Information School to serve as a public affairs officer for additional duties. Leslie served in a variety of positions, including NBC instructor, recruiting and retention, and media relations liaison with the Military District of Washington in 1998 during the highly publicized Sergeant Major of the United States Army Court Martial at Fort Belvoir in 1999. She was featured on the official United States Army uniform poster and was deployed to El Salvador for Task Force New Hope to support Hurricane Mitch relief and recovery mission efforts. Leslie deployed to Bosnia in September 2001 with the 29th Infantry Division for Stabilization Force during Operation Joint Forge. And then, you know, when you hear her story and we go on to the truth sharing and into details, you know, she has been passionate, a passionate advocate for veterans uh, and wounded ill, injured warriors, and their families as well. But we got a new hit on here. We got another star we'll talk about later. But thank you so much. Good evening, Captain Leslie Smith. Hi, everyone, and good evening. And thank you, Mommy Activist and Lady Tori, for having us on your show. This is great. Thank you. Oh, it's it's such a privilege to do this. You know, I read your bio, but it didn't talk about too much about your uh, your upbringing and where you're from. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, absolutely. I'm uh, originally from Winchester, Virginia, and lived there for a few years based on my dad's Army career. And after a few years there, we moved, and actually I grew up in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, which is very close to Gettysburg, and just had you know a great upbringing. Like you, know, you said, I had um, two great parents that provided everything, and anything that I could have imagined. And the one thing that I was taught was giving back and helping others. And so from a very early age, really about nine or 10 years old, I was volunteering with the Red Cross, like helping to give swimming lessons. And from the values and the morals and the ethics that my parents instilled in me, I just grew up with that philosophy that it's all about giving back. So when I graduated from high school and was deciding what to do, I just furthered that uh, philosophy and wanted to make my dad proud especially and decided that by serving in our military and the Army would be the best way to make him proud and to continue that legacy of serving and and giving back. So it uh, really has been an honor to wear the uniform and to represent, you know, our females in the military and our women veterans, and that we can be beautiful. We can be a woman and wear the uniform and be strong and beautiful inside and out. And I certainly have no regrets on my service and what I've been able to accomplish since then, having been medically retired after serving in Bosnia. So really, just like you said earlier in the show, it's what you you do 
with life and if you're handed um, some lemons and turning that into lemonade and, and making it the best drink possible. And exactly, you did that. You know, I did a little research because I was interested because when I told people about the story or I sent, I've sent the flyer out and people said, she's a captain. I say, yeah, wow. And then I thought about it. I said, this is 2019. It should say, wow, she's a captain. But people, you know, were amazed. She's a captain. And I said, wow, let me see, what, the, what have women been doing in the military? And then I, you know, I saw reports. Of course, you see a report in 2013. It comes from stats from 2011. It takes about two years to get stuff going. And in 2011, they said that 203,000, 100,000 women were active in the duty you know, in the Air Force out of 1.4 million. And, they, you know, they gave the stats for how many were in the Army, how many in the Navy, and different stuff like that, and Marine Corps as well. And then later on, they start, the history started to change, and they say with historic numbers, women are in uniform, you know, and said the veteran community is changing. And you see these pictures of these women, and they're doing the same as guys, you know, not – yeah, not so amazed at that, but you've got to be able to. <laughs> Tell us, how tough was it for you in there? Now, before you, we get into what happened, but how tough was it when you, were, when you went in the service? Tell us about that when you got in. <laughs> well, well it, was, it was certainly challenging, you know, just uh, being a woman, and the first thing that you want to do is right off the bat prove that you are just as worthy as your fellow male counterparts, you know, that, are, that you're doing the same training with and really more of like the physical demands. The one thing that I felt like I personally was always challenged with was just being a little bit on the shorter side <laughs> was carrying all of our gear, you know, your duffel bags. I mean, they were basically as tall as I was, you know, standing, you know, on the, putting the duffel bag and standing it up and filling it with all your gear. So I didn't have that uh, physique, you know, that a male does right. who's taller and right. just bigger to carry because you have to carry the same equipment. You know, it's your duffel bags. It's, it's um, you know, the gas mask. It's your, your weapon. It's the LBE, your, you know, the, the belt that you wear that carries the canteens and, and everything that you need in the field. And so you have to really just figure it all out. But as women... You know, we are always determined to take on whatever that challenge or mission might be. And I think that just instills a drive in us to figure it out and overcome and be the best that we can be so that we can prove, not really just to ourselves completely, but also to our male counterparts, that we are just as worthy. We have just right. as much value. We have just the same amount of intelligence as they do to do the same job and that's why now, you know, jobs are opening up to women in the military to serve in the front, front line types of positions. So we are making headway. We are making strides with changing that stereotype that a woman more or less has to just only serve in a certain capacity in the military. And I fully right. support that, that women have the opportunity to be in any role or any position that are, that a male can do or a man can do because honestly we can do it just the same if not better and I think that working side by side actually brings out the best in both men and women in uniform and you know on one of the quotes I saw in the in one of the things I read and it says that it's critical to remember that women aren't just small men Say women's body, proportionate and hormonal makeup are different. And so I said, well, they shouldn't have put that in there, but okay. But, you know, when you put your mind to something, that's the power, the mind over the matter. You know, when you know you can do something and you're determined, you can get it done. You can get it done. That's and I'm right. telling you, I know they would be totally amazed um, at you, you know, and I know I can imagine you coming in and those guys, you know, probably figuring, oh, she's not going to make it. She's not going to make it, you know. But you made it all the way to captain. You made it all the way to captain. That's just amazing. To most, but that's, when I, that's the thing that people said. She's a captain. Should they say, but they didn't say it like, you know, bringing you up like, wow. You know, they said, she's a captain. It's like, you mean she's still, they, you know, she made it. You did. You made it. But then in, uh, when you were in Bosnia, is it, when, yeah. you know, you developed some, some uh, complications. Let's talk about that a little bit, please. Yes. Yeah, so I volunteered to deploy to Bosnia, and mm -hmm. it was 
we were at Fort Dix, which is in New Jersey, which was really just the outskirts of, of New York City, and 9-11 oh. happened. And we were ready to, to pretty much go to deploy over to Bosnia. And everybody honestly thought our mission was going to get changed because our homeland had just been attacked. And we were already a division ready to go. So that means we were trained up. We had all the equipment. I mean, we were, you know, boots on the ground. And we ended up being sent forward, though, to Bosnia a week later. It was like September 17th or 18th. And I remember on the, you know, the flight over, everybody honestly thought we were going into World War III because of what had just happened with the attacks of 9-11. So mm -hmm. there was certainly heightened threat um, worldwide, and especially, you know, when we got to, to Bosnia. Even though our mission was really, we were there to help the people rebuild the, their towns, the churches, you know, the schools, just really help them to regain their freedom. And what was so captivating to me was that the people would literally thank us every day, multiple times, you know, in the day, because we did interact with the local people. And they were just so genuine and warm-hearted, and they would shake, you know, your hand, have tears in their eyes, and be saying, thank you, U.S. troops, you know, for being here. Thank you for helping us. We couldn't um, do it without you. We, we love you, America, you know, and we, we're glad you're here. And that was priceless. I mean, you can't really find the right word that describes mm -hmm. that emotion and that connection and that reward of, again, going back to talking about, you know, how I was brought up with, giving back and helping others. And so my job in Bosnia was, I was a public affairs officer. So my job was to coordinate and make sure all of the visitors that came, such as celebrities, politicians, high-ranking military officers that came in country, I planned and executed and organized their trip so that once they stepped you know, in theater, it went smoothly. They got to see everything they needed to, and just everything ran like clockwork. It was like you know a mission. Mm -hmm. And I fell in love with what you know I did. I was again so taken back by the the genuine um, showing from the people that I then requested to stay for a second tour, which was approved. And I was I was thrilled because I was like I really want to be here. I want to continue what I'm doing. And then it was like I hit this first brick wall, and two weeks before the end of this initial deployment, I developed a blood clot in my left leg. And I remember thinking, I mean, I just had all this pain and swelling. I could really, after a few days, I could hardly walk. But I hid all of this because, again, I didn't want to uh, not be able to do my job or complete the mission. And right. so in all this pain and misery, I'm, you know, I'm trying to walk. I'm trying to get through everything because I didn't want to come across that, uh, you know, like I was this weak person or I was a weak soldier or really in a sense the weak female soldier. So I put up with it and it finally got to the point I could hardly walk and went to mm -hmm. the clinic and they did the ultrasound test. Yes, you have blood clot. And I'm thinking, what is a blood clot? You know, like this is silly. It's going to go away. I'll be fine. And then the next thing, I was in the commanding general's office with the brigade surgeon having this conversation. And I'm trying to argue this point medically that I'm perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with looking at me. I can do this. And it really came down to the general saying, Smith, pack your bags. You're out of here tonight. Mm -hmm. And I just remembered feeling so devastated as if the world was just taken from me because I didn't. I didn't have a, a say in it. It's like I lost that argument. And having to go back to the little uh, comics that I lived in, this little kind of square box, and gather mm -hmm. up literally what I could carry, my personal things, and I had to leave. That was it. I didn't even get a chance to say goodbye to fellow service members. I didn't get a chance to say goodbye to the local people that you know, I had gotten to know and who had become like family. And it was literally like the most devastating, crushing thing to have to leave as a service member and not fulfill the mission, at least the initial deployment, and return with your division mm -hmm. with that pride and that sense of like, I made a difference in the world. So I get back to the United States 
And you know, looking back, obviously, it was the general really best decision because very, very quickly and very rapidly, uh, everything started to spiral downward from complications, these unexpected kind of spontaneous complications from this blood clot. And I ended up at Walter Reed Army Medical Hospital. And my parents were called in. I was actually retired, you know, like on the spot at Walter Reed. The Army placed me on what they called imminent death status, which was a 24-hour time frame that they gave you that this is all that you know I was going to survive. I would not survive past 24 hours. And the social worker was called in and actually sat down with my parents and asked them directly if they wanted me buried at Arlington National Cemetery mm-hmm. or if they would want to take my body you know, back home to Pennsylvania for, for burial. So it was literally, it was, it was life and death, but it, it was going towards, of course, me, you know, me passing. And what was so amazing, though, the doctors and nurses, of course, the best in the world, and they didn't quite give up, and they were researching other cases, anything similar. Uh, I was told they were contacting other medical facilities across the country, up into Canada, overseas, it's like Europe. I mean, it was like this crazy, crazy search for something similar. And what they came back with was one last, more or less, ditch effort with a medicine. And they went to my parents and my little brother, who was actually in medical school to be an Army doctor, and they said, we can give her this medicine. However, what could happen is just because there's so much going on and she, she is dying, she could mm. pass away even sooner and take away the last, like maybe remaining 10 hours that you have to say goodbye. Wow. Or, you know, it could possibly turn things around. And my mom has told me, you know, it's like without hesitation. They said, give her the medicine. <laughs> we have to try we have to try it. And they did give it to me, and thank goodness it slowly started to stop this horrible process that was, um, my body was just clotting itself inside. And I look back and I say I survived due to the grace of God and the amazing staff, the medical staff. And the third part of my survival I credit to the fact that my own stubbornness that somewhere deep inside I knew it was not my time, you know, to go. It was just not my time. I had more to do and it could not be over at this point. And so fortunately, I did survive, but I ended up, I did lose my left leg uh, right below my knee. And I certainly had the questions right off the bat of why me or why did this have to happen and how was I ever going to be normal, you know, because I've just had this trauma, this life-changing loss to my body. I realized, though, as, you know, as the days went on that, and everybody has this choice every single day, that you can either decide to wake up and be a victim and completely you know, like give up, and in my case, just roll over in the hospital bed and face the wall and say, I'm done, I give up. Or you can choose to fight and make the best of this new situation, take this challenge head on, again, make that, you know, lemonade out of the lemons that you're given, and I just decided to fight like hell. I just decided that there was too much yet to be done. And what kind of pushed me in that direction, really the first question that I had for the doctor when I came out of the surgery from the amputation was I asked him directly if I would ever be able to wear high heels again. And I never (laughs) even asked if I could walk. I just was more worried about wearing high heels. and, And I'm thinking, where did that come from? You know, because why was not walking the very first thing when you're missing, you know, part of one of your legs. And then when my mom talked to me after the surgery and in the hospital room, the first thing I'd really said to her was that I used to be a cheerleader. 
And so that was on my mind. And she, she took my hand and she said, yes, and now you can be the coach. And that right. truly set me on the path of understanding that even though I could not wear the uniform anymore because I was medically retired, and then I couldn't fight the fight, so to say, and deploy again in, in, an, in that kind of capacity, that I had a new mission. I actually had a bigger purpose. And that was, again, to continue helping and giving back. And how that all came to be and understanding that this was meant to happen, that I was to go to Bosnia at that time. Because then when we had service members coming back from Iraq or Afghanistan initially, I was already at Walter Reed. And I was able to answer the questions that they had that I also had initially, you know, like for the doctor. Um, like, can you show me a prosthetic? How, how um, heavy is it? Do you wear it when you sleep? Do you wear it when you take a shower? Like all these things that are so new because there's no manual for amputation. I mean, death is expected in life, but amputation is not. And there's no manual or instructions on how you're to feel or really, you know, how you're to react or what questions. And so... I gained a lot of strength and healing myself from understanding that I was there to be there for the guys coming back. And yeah. so in therapy, when I, was, when I was walking, I always say I was, I was very wobbly, but at least I was up and kind of, you know, like walking and I had a prosthetic. Mm -hmm. And I would go over to them at therapy and in their initial stages of the new amputee that I had been in, you know, months previously. And the instantaneous bond and connection from the same questions, it was like I brought that, um, I guess, sense of comfort or that sense of stability that I could answer the questions. They could see a fellow service member in a prosthetic and having survived it and then able to answer their questions truly did give me a lot of strength and courage and understanding that I had this new purpose and this new mission and it was now my passion because I understood why this all had happened. So really the question of why me, why me, really I turned it into, well, why not me? Why wouldn't I be able to handle this? You know, I have military training. I have the discipline from everything that we were taught, you know, physically, mentally, emotionally, all of the training that we did. And, you know, I just really took a step back and I'm thinking, this is really, again, what I'm supposed to be doing. And it right. grew, it really just grew from there and talking to, you know, our wounded, ill, and injured that were returning at Walter Reed and then getting involved as time went on with different organizations or military-related, you know, foundations and finding every way that I could to, to just be able to give back and to continue serving. And for people that don't know that Walter Reed, that's a national military medical center here in Washington, D.C. And it's, the, it's supposed to be the, nation, the nation's largest and most renowned uh, military medical center. So when you were sent there, you were, getting, you were supposed to be getting top of the line uh, help. But it did say that you, while you were, I'm not sure if while you were away, you con contracted some kind of chemical agent or toxin, did you? Right, because in addition to losing my left leg, mm -hmm. I then have lost just about all of my vision, so I am now legally blind. I guess if you put a percentage on it for prospective listeners, I have about probably 5 to 10% max vision that's left. Mm -hmm. and, and so through Walter Reed and Johns Hopkins, you know, in Baltimore, Maryland, and trying to come up with, answers as to what took my vision and really pulling all this together, it was um, more or less concluded that I had been exposed to, yes, some form of agent or a toxin while serving in Bosnia and that it more or less is, the doctor explained, it's in my body, it'll never go away and it lies dormant. And then when it attacks, what it does is it comes after my, my eyesight. And so now, and, you know, on top of being an amputee, uh, being legally blind and adjusting and coping with all of that has certainly 
had its challenges, but what I've found is that the the foundation that I had built or that had been created from again the military, even the, like my parents raising me and the time at Walter Reed laid that foundation mm-hmm. to be able to say, no matter what I am hit with or whatever might be taken away, I'm stronger than that and I will overcome. I just might have to do things differently. But what happens too is you, you find this inner strength, this inner fortitude that each and every one of us has. And yeah. whenever you're faced with whatever challenge or obstacle it might be that you need to dig down deep and find that, you have it. And when you tap into it, it's like look out world because here I come and nothing is literally going to stop me. If anything, it gives you more motivation, more empowerment, more um, courage and commitment and inspiration to overcome it and then give back to help somebody else. Even if it's just one person, when you know that you've made a difference for one person, that makes everything that you've been through and had to overcome worth it. Because, again, the power in helping is the best feeling in, in the world. And I have, with my military service, I have no regrets because I wouldn't be where I'm at today and in the capacity that I am if it hadn't been, you know, that I lost my leg and even losing my vision. Because it's as if each time I do get knocked down, I get up, I think, even stronger and I'm able to give back even more because I, you know, I lost my leg first. Then a few years later, I lost the sight in my left eye. I picked myself back up. And then not long after that, that's when I lost uh, most of the vision in the right eye and now legally blind. And it really has been an incredible journey because I've realized that I have gained more inner peace spelling P-E-A-C-E, with every physical piece that I've lost, you know, like the, your body part piece, P-I-E-C-E. Right. And that's, that's right. a very profound statement when you can say that, you know, piece by piece, because it shows, again, the, the capacity and the resiliency of the human spirit of, again, if you believe in yourself and you have that um, faith that you can overcome, you really are unstoppable with what you can do and giving back and making a difference. And you're exactly right. I mean, to hear that, that alone before we get into the even other parts of you is so inspiring that, you know, no one should have a complaint. You know, no one should have a complaint at all. And, you know, as I was reading, I found out how much of an advocate you really are and being a spokesperson for so many organizations. You know, uh, Canines for Veterans, as we talk about your other star, your co-star, you know, right. we talk about, right. you know, talk about things like at the USO, the Fisher House Foundation, and you also teamed up with actor Gary Sinise to raise uh, awareness on the American Veterans Disabled for Life Memorial. And, you know, also co-founder, you know, of Fatigue to Fabulous, which is very uh, I wouldn't say very rewarding because women want to look good even in fatigues. you got people now wearing fatigues all over town. I mean, they wearing that camouflage. Uh, I think i got pants, you know, that are, uh, you know, that are cute, that are, have that <laughs> camouflage, you know, because of you made it, uh, like, made it sexy, I want to say. You know, you made it something that was more um, than just a, I want a cookie cutter thing. You put personality to it. And that, that leads to pride. You know, it's not like you have to be kind of uh, alienated because you're in the service, you know. And, and when I read all the things you've done, especially for making, you, you started designing some fatigues for women before this happened, did you? Well, I had been on uh, Project Runway, All mm-hmm. Stars, yeah. and, <laughs> you know, that was an experience because they, what I had suggested that I was envisioning for my outfit, you know, turned into a completely different um, vision <laughs> with a military theme, you know. So right, right. It's, um, you know, and I've worked with uh, Marist College. They're based out of, um, in New York. They were working on a senior thesis with designing, yes, um, a clothing line for people with vision loss. And, you know, so, and then my other 
big thing, going back to my first question to the doctor, you know, wearing high heels, uh, pretty right. amazing shout out to uh, Walter Reed when making my prosthetics. They actually created a special high heel, you know, leg for me that wasn't on the market, that they mm-hmm. had to take components and actually invert them and to make a leg that would allow me to wear four and a half, five inch, um, like stiletto heels. Which wow. <laughs> his, you know, and that was that was something that took a lot of practice and a lot of, oh, um, yeah. you know, falling down. But I tell you what, I'd lock myself in my room, literally, like lock myself in and practice, practice, practice. And I would trip and stumble and I'd kind of like, oh, goodness. I'd get back up, you know, you mm-hmm. take a few more steps because you have to learn the balance and how the, your different muscles work and the coordination and the energy that goes into that is like insane, you know. So, right. But it was something that, that I overcame, and I absolutely, you know, love heels and a concept that, or a campaign that I'm working on is it's called Healed Up, spelled H-E-A-L-E-D, you know, like up, that meaning mm-hmm. uh, no matter what you might be facing, you can, you can wear those high heels because you've overcome, and you can have strength in every step that you take on that path to your survival, to your rehab, to your recovery. And when you look back at yourself and think, wow, this is how far I've come, and you're wearing heels, I mean, to a woman, we all love shoes. We love, you know, pretty beautiful, you know, shoes. And that's that's something I'm very proud of, that when I've been told by my prosthetist at Walter Reed that they've had other female veteran amputees say, you know that, you know, Soldier, you know, Leslie, and, and uh, she comes in with those high heels. That's the leg that I want. So I know right. that's making a difference, you know, and that when you can say you're healed up, no fear, walk strong, I mean, there's power in that. And it goes back to, like, what you were saying, that you can still be a woman in the military. You can still be beautiful and feminine and strong and wear that uniform. And that's really, too, the message behind, um, you know, healed up for anybody facing any mm-hmm. type of, of challenge, um, you know, it doesn't have to be necessarily amputation. It could be cancer. It could be some other type of illness or, again, just obstacle you're trying to, to overcome. And, you know, let's face it, <laughs> girls, when we are in our heels, we do feel at our best and we do feel, you know, that strength and, and that beauty come from inside because we feel good and we look good. And you know it does take practice in those four inch stilettos and I'll be a sister to tell you that I said no, I better not. <laughs> I said, one day I, I was going to a meeting and I always carry another bag with the flat I had my flats and I had my nice things that coordinate with my outfit. And that day I had all these papers to take and I said, Okay, I know, I might have to I get a space, I have to walk and all this stuff and I walked I put my heels I always put my heels on. I put my heels on because I wanna make sure they don't hurt. If they hurt, I can't do them. Another pair got. I don't care. At that point, I didn't even be a, a cosmetologist for like a, almost fifty years. I know that. Uh. Uh-uh, uh. If my feet hurt, that's not happening. And I take him walking. And one time, I put these beautiful heels when I was out shopping, and I must have lost my mind. But I said, No, I'm going to wear them. So I practiced a little. When I the meeting was in Philadelphia, and went to this fancy museum, you know, to have the the dinner and stuff. And I just had a prayer, and I put those things on, and. I just went on. But I had practice. When you said you practiced, I did too. I practiced to make sure I won't <laughs> topple over. It's like you could topple over. And, oh, my goodness, but it, it's, it's such a challenge. But, you know, you made challenge worthwhile. You made it not easy, but it's like something, you you know, you, you get into your passion. You know, it's just something you got to do. And for you to do that. And the other ladies say, no, I want, I want that so I can wear high heels. I think I saw you on an interview, and you showed that. And, you know, okay. and people pop, millions of people saw that. And they say, I want heels. Because it made me remember those silver bad heels I bought that I paid like six fifty for. that, you know, I said, wait a minute, I went to look for them. I said, you know, I give things away too, Purple Heart. I said, now, did I give my heels away? And I went, I looked at them and I laughed. I said, well, they're going to stay there, but I don't know who's going to wear them because I think <laughs> it's not going to be me. But, you know, you have had so many uh, things you've done. Now, we can't leave out you being an athlete, you know, and, right. and the well, things that you've completed. Right. Well, you know, it's it's a natural progression when we were, like, at, at Walter Reed, we all 
follow this course, and it really does make sense mm -hmm. that the next part of your, you know, your initial rehab and recovery are the athletics. And, mm -hmm. and what's so crazy is, you know, I never really in the military was a fast runner. I, you know, ha I'm, again, short. So, for, you know, I'm taking baby steps, you know, 10 baby steps for every stride, you know, like my male counterparts are, are taking. And so the thought of even doing a marathon was just absolutely um, crazy. And, but what happens is when you're given that second chance at life, literally, you open up and it's like, well, I want to do everything. I want to try everything. Because, again, it's just that motivation of the second chance. You don't want to miss out on things that you said no to or maybe weren't willing to even consider because it was maybe well, there was just too much effort, it didn't interest you, wasn't the right time. And so we had the opportunity to start participating in marathon races, like with the Achilles Freedom Team out of New York City. Mm -hmm. And it just dominoes from there because once you complete a race, it just drives you because you're saying to yourself, literally, I'm an amputee or I have vision loss or whatever it may be and I'm doing a marathon. Like this doesn't even make sense in the same sense, you know, amputee and marathon. And so that drives you, it motivates you to finish the race. And when you cross the finish line, I would just remember thinking like, yes, I just did a marathon, but I also just crossed like the survival line of, of life because, again, everything came back to what I had gone through, you know, the imminent death, the losing my leg and with the vision. And, again, it's just so empowering and that you can take that and put that energy into inspiring somebody else and that it also, amongst, you know, my fellow um, military comrades in doing this, it propelled us then to want to do more. So then instead of, saying, okay, well, hey, I did a marathon, check the block. Now we're doing two and three and, you know, and four marathons. Mm -hmm. You're mm -hmm. getting into the triathlon. Um, you're going and you're you know, climbing mountains, doing scuba diving, and ev everything possible. Because, again, it's, it just instills in you that you don't want to not live each day to the fullest. And right. from everything and all these experiences, I had this another personal motto where I would refer to it as amplify your life. If you can imagine the word amplify with the AMP capitalized to signify mm. amputee, but then mm -hmm. also the word amplify meaning what? You turn something up. You know, you make it louder. You make it bigger. You know, you make it right. bolder. And I started to live by that philosophy as well, that you amplify your life and that you'll be amazed if you just try what you can accomplish. And if you don't, if you can't do it like a regular way, meaning like I didn't have part of my leg, so I couldn't, like an able-bodied person, well, you just, you know, you figure it out. And again, you understand how empowering that is, that you can figure it out, and it's not about giving up and saying I can't do it, but how can I do it? How can I accomplish this? And then in turn, it gives you that, that sense of accomplishment to be a role model or, again, to give back because you're finding this inner strength that you want to share because it's so overwhelmingly positive that it's making such a difference for you. Why right. wouldn't you want to share it? And then that, in turn, you know, helped, again, to keep me going with different organizations, like you mentioned, and different ways to give back, um, like with the VA and serving as a secretarial appointee on the Women Veterans Advisory Committee. You know, how can we make um, health care better for women? How can we improve the resources and the accessibility? And it just, it just thrives and grows from there. And again, it just comes back to that, that passion that, that um, I talked about, that new mission, that new purpose, and has been my passion ever since. I mean, you know, and then to talk about all the exposure you've had with uh, print publications, radio interviews, and TV, not leaving out people that uh, watch soap operas, the uh, day, days of our lives you were on there bringing up the awareness on uh, post-traumatic stress, which is a big deal yeah. for people coming yeah. home uh, in the military. It's something that, that was like hush-hush, and if, it was almost like a, a code. If you weren't in the military, they didn't talk with you about it. And then... 
everybody wanted to just not talk about it at all or not act on it, you know, and a lot of other things occur because of that stress. Right, exactly. And and the great thing with having the opportunity to be on Days of Our Lives is I actually played, you know, like myself. And I told them my story and they wrote my lines uh, based on my story. So, you know, I wasn't playing a character. I was playing, Mm -hmm. you know, myself and talking about, everything that we're talking about, the challenges, you know, how to overcome and getting help and understanding that it is not a sign of weakness at all Mm -hmm. by any means to reach out for help, to talk to your battle buddy, to just say, I'm having a bad day. I mean, I absolutely have bad days and and some frustrations. Um, We all do. And it's just having really that understanding that you're not alone. And that's the one thing I've found in the last, what, 15, 16 years of, of working with our veterans, the one most powerful lesson I've learned in talking to veterans and their families is everybody feels that they're alone and that no other veteran has the mm-hmm. same feelings. And mm-hmm. when I'm ta- you know, talking or if we're talking in a group, the smiles and the the relief that you see in a fellow veteran's like face or their, their body, their expressions, is, is amazing because they relate and they're like, wait, oh, I'm not the only one. You mean you right. feel that way too? Or, oh my gosh, it's okay. You, know, you, you understand me. You understand exactly what I'm thinking. And it's like, yes, absolutely. And again, in that moment, these connections and this bond is created and this hope and belief that you're not alone is changed. And that's really that first step, that first motivator that a person has to take and reaching out. And once you do connect with the resources and the networks, which is is one thing I focus very hard on in connecting people with what they need, it does change lives. It does make that impact because they're understanding they haven't been forgotten, that they're still valued, they're still worthy, they're still a whole person despite having a visible or an invisible wound, you still can contribute to society and give back and make that difference. Because really from the beginning, when you're in the service, doesn't matter which branch, it is about giving back, helping others, and making that difference. And and so I'm just, I'm very glad and, and, um, you know, and all the awareness that's being made now with, suicide prevention, right. and the resources, the resources that are out there and that are presented in a way that it's not something that you have to dig for or find or feel embarrassed if you need to reach out. You know, the resources are there and there's more emphasis now that's being made on making sure veterans are aware of how to get that help. Right. And, you know, you think about it, veterans should be the last ones that don't get everything. Because from the very beginning, when you choose to serve, you're giving back from that moment on. You know, you don't maybe call it right. giving back. You may not, may not look at it like come, giving back when you're in your tour of duty or in, still in the, uh, doing your 20 years or something like that. You know, you don't look at it like that. You just, people look, you look at you like you just went to work. But no, you're giving back from the day you sign up. Yes, and it yes, should never and be a, a last thing for you, for veterans. It should never be a last thing. Right. You know, and, and I think about it like that. Right. And that's where, you know, I really have ever since uh, my, you know, experience when I honestly thought, you know, my life was over. I never, if somebody would have said, well, in 5, 10, 15 years, this is what you're going to be doing, I would have never believed it because of just, the questions and the doubts that I did have in the beginning. And it has been a journey. It has been a process. And like I said, one that I'm very thankful for and I have no regrets because there really is, there's just no greater. And you're right, from the moment, you know, you're in uniform, you are giving up so much of yourself. You are placing your country before yourself. And your family serves as well. Especially, you know, on on a deployment, it is, it is very difficult to be the family member back home. I remember when I deployed to Bosnia, how different it was from whenever my little brother, 
who mm-hmm. now is an army doctor, deployed to Afghanistan, and it was like, I'm the family back home. That's, it's gut-wrenching. It is right. difficult. You know, it is a challenge in itself to maintain and continue um, what you need to do to, you know, run the house or, you know, keep the kids, you know, in line or do your job, whatever you've got right. going on, with the thought in your mind that a loved one is deployed, you know, in a dangerous place in the world. And it's, it's a level, it, it is, it's, it's a level above, you know, with giving back. And so you're right, from day one, it's more than a job. It, it is definitely more than a job. And I'm just, I am glad that there's been so much more, like we're saying, awareness and emphasis on our service members and then also our female veterans. You know, it's the women in the military is the fastest growing population. And I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud to, you know, have worn the uniform and to have had the experiences and the opportunities that, that I have had. And it's, it's a part of me and it's a part of my, you know, story and it's, it's just something that I love to share because like I said, if I can help this one person and connect them to an organization or a resource or somewhere where they need help or if they even have questions, you know, I always encourage people to reach out to me 24-7 that that's what I'm here for and, and that I just encourage people to, to reach out to me. And I mean, if they, you know, I can't imagine that they don't. You're everywhere. I mean, to find you, if they have a problem and they search, your name has to be on the top. You know, if not top first, the second or third, it's there right. for help, you know. And you're quite a movie star because you've been on Netflix, House of Cards, uh, Criminal Minds, CBS is Criminal Minds, you know, in <laughs> NCI, New York. I watch all of these, you know. I watch them just to, you know, they're good. They're just good shows, all I can say. And, you know, you've been a lot of places, things that I've read, you know, Good Morning America, you know, I mean, places like that, Katie Kirk, you know, and then you uh, were with George Bush when he started Wounded Warriors, is that right? Yes, in 2007, he had established a commission, yes, that was focusing on, you know, Wounded Warrior care whenever we were returning back to the United States and, and at the forefront, yes, of that and making sure that our wounded, ill, and injured were receiving, you know, the best care possible. And again, all about the resources and the network and ensuring, like you said earlier, that our military and our veterans are receiving the best care possible because they have earned it through serving. And right. it is the best way for our nation to say thank you is when veterans return is to, is to take care of them and to acknowledge and recognize them and thank them for their service. I mean, you know, you've done everything. You've done everything. I, I look and, I, you know, it's amazing. That's why I say I had to get the thing to come back and read it to me so I could take notes or read along because it was so much to take in. And I got it on big print. I don't have no problem with reading it, but I wanted to, <laughs> it read to me. Tori, you have any questions or anything to add? Well, I really wanted to say thank you for, you know, everything that you've um, you've done and you're doing. And, um, you know, you spoke of Walter Reed, and I was once a resident myself as a um, a three-year-old getting my heart uh, surgery on. So they definitely take care of you, you know, once they, once they find the solution, they take care of you. So I definitely agree. Um, and also, um, could you tell us how to reach you and um, get in touch with you and learn more about your foundations and things you have going on? Yes, to definitely reach me, I'm on Facebook, um, Leslie Nicole Smith, and I'm on LinkedIn under Leslie Nicole Smith, and on Twitter as Leslie Smith, Captain Smith 91, and I'm an ambassador for the Gary Sinise Foundation, and so that website is GarySiniseFoundation.org, and you can certainly go to the website, and there's just so many programs that uh, Gary Sinise and the foundation offer, you know, just a, an array and a, a whole realm of programs from ways, you know, that they're giving back and contributing to veterans and families. And I really just, like I said, encourage people to reach, you know, out to me directly and then I can maybe see what's best or what um, issue or question you might have and then help to get you connected to the right person 
or organization um, that will either you know, get you the help or again, get you the answer uh, that you might need. And again, to, to help make you know, your life better or that of your family because again, that's what it's, it's just all about is being here for each other and continuing to lift each other up and to help. And now we have to go to this one part. We can't leave out. Let, tell, us, tell everybody about Isaac. Oh, Isaac, right? <laughs> oh, he is, yes, that's right. He is, um, he is my hero and my best friend, and he has an amazing story. He is my service dog, and mm -hmm. we have been a team for 10 years, and he, he was a stray dog, actually, in Myrtle Beach. He was running, you know, wild, <laughs> wildly in the streets of Myrtle Beach. He was... <laughs> Of course, rescued by the you know Humane Society, he was taken to the shelter. And his story is that he was kind of a little bit ornery and a little bit you know unruly and just had all kinds of energy that a young you know couple month old puppy would have. That people were not applying to adopt him. Now he's a yellow lab golden retriever mix. He's beautiful. So he's got <laughs> yeah this cutest face. You know he's the perfect kind of. Um, mix of, of two breeds, you know, and like the all-American kind of, you know, dog. So it's kind of hard to believe that no one was interested in adopting him. But I think it's because he probably just, again, he was misbehaving and, you know, he mm -hmm. just was being a typical <laughs> little pup. But, I mean, fortunately, Canines for Veterans came through because Isaac, like me, had 24 hours. He was placed on the euthanasia list. And I'm not joking. He had mm -hmm. 24 hours before he was going to be euthanized. And I mm -hmm. say that God brought us together because we each were down to like our last 24 hours and that we were meant to be together. And so when Canines for Veterans came through and they see, uh, they see this puppy, you know, this yellow lab retriever, mm -hmm. they're thinking perfect potential service dog. And what they did was they gave him um, a command test where to see how quickly he could follow directions and absorb, you know, the command of probably it was sit. And they said he was, you know, he just aced it. I mean, he was like this superstar. And, of <laughs> course, they, they scooped him up. They got him out of there right then. And then he went into school at Camp Lejeune in North Carolina, and he mm -hmm. was trained by Marines who were actually serving their time in the military brig and he was trained for a year. And I ended up calling Canines for Veterans because another fellow soldier had a service dog from the same organization. And I'll never forget because when I called and, you know, I'd said about applying and I put in my application. And when they called me back and they said, we have the perfect dog for you. His name is Isaac and he's been waiting for his special person. <laughs> uh, it was like, you know, it was, it was meant to be. There, there's no doubt in my mind that it was it was meant to be, and I was paired with Isaac based on he was the strongest and biggest dog that they had, and with everything that I was doing with all the travel and you know just kind of different environments and different venues from day to day, they felt he would be the most adaptable, and he has just been again my hero, my best friend. I really can't ever find the right word that. Mm. just covers everything that he means to me. And, but here's a perfect story that I do have to share because it's just the incredible connection and, and the intuition of dogs, you know, just in general. So whenever I had lost my vision with being legally blind, and, and long story short, you know, I came home and sat down on the couch and Isaac, sat right in front of me, and it's a low-level couch, so he was basically, you know, pretty much level with me, and he just stared at my face. He just kept looking, you know, into my eyes, and, and at mm. the time, my eyes had had some minor surgery. I, it, was, it was a mess. I'll just put it that way. My eyes looked a mess, and he just stared what seemed like an eternity to me, and it was like he didn't really blink. It was just he just stared. And I 
really feel he was taking it all in, and then he kind of snapped out of it, like, okay, got it. Like, okay, Mom, you know, like, I got it, I got you. And then the next <laughs> morning, this is still what just fascinates me to this day. The next morning, it was like reality hit. I'm like legally blind. I will never drive again. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know where to go. I mean, blindness is, is you know, is, is very traumatic. And he sits down. He's right in front of me. And with the most gentlest, gentlest tip of his tongue, kisses my cheeks and literally licks away the tears. Like one cheek, the other cheek, one cheek, the other cheek. Lick, 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 you know, as, each, as the tears started to come down. And any other time, and every kiss since then, he has given me the typical big sloppy tongue Isaac kiss. You know, there's no gentleness, there's no tip of the tongue, you know, yeah. kind of very, you know, butterfly. I mean, he was communicating with me in that moment right. that I understand I know you can't see. I'm here. I've got your back. I'm not going to let you down. I'm going to be your eyes. You know, I'm going to guide you. And right. it's amazing that he, he gave me that message. He gave me that strength and that understanding that he's never going to not be there for me. Still probably be crying to this day if it hadn't been for that powerful um, communication that he gave me. He, he understood. And what's amazing, too, and a testament to the training from Canines for Veterans, Rick Hairston, is the fact that Isaac changed all on his own. Like, he, hmm. we didn't go back for additional blindness training. He yeah. actually adapted what he needed to do. And a perfect example is when the dogs are trained, they're trained to pick things up. You know, so if you drop a pencil, they, they pick it up, and then they sit there and they wait for you to, to take the item, Okay. But in this case, now with the vision loss, Isaac knows I can't see. So when I drop that mm -hmm. pencil or whatever it may be, all on his own, he picks it up, of course. But then all on his own, what he does is he nose butts me. He taps me with his nose and saying, I'm here, Mom. I know you can't see me, but I'm here, mm -hmm. and I'm tapping you on your leg. So reach down, and I will put this pencil, you know, like in your hand or whatever wow. the item, you know, might be. He mm -hmm. knew that all on his own, like that knowledge, that intuition, that compassion from this amazing, you know, dog who had been again, the stray, you know, unruly, ornery, you know, puppy at the shelter, goes from that to this level of, of in his own sense, giving back and, and helping. And I'm just still amazed at that and that powerful message that he conveyed to me that, you know, I've got you. I know what I need to do. I'm going to adapt. We're going to get through this. And, yes, he is my co-star. He's been um, <laughs> on all of these shows. He's been on, you know, mm -hmm. well, Project Runway All-Stars. They made a matching mm -hmm. outfit for him, <laughs> Days of Our Lives. He played mm -hmm. himself. He played himself, you know, Criminal Minds on our, that end scene. I mean, it's just been, he's been, um, you know, he's just been everywhere with me. Right. And I couldn't do it, you know, without him. And he gives me so much um, joy and he makes me laugh. He's just, because he's a goofball. As hard as he works, he, his personality is he's kind of a goofball. And so he makes me laugh. He truly, he truly is a treasure. He is, he is such a blessing. And I guess I could say he's my soul dog because, again, we have that similar 24-hour connection in our story. And you know how you have a soul mate, you know, a soul person? <laughs> it's like he's my soul <laughs> dog you know because he realized i think he realizes that that's his place because you saved him too you know right and he realizes his place I, and I, I imagine that he sensed that sometimes that something's changing for him and maybe it's not so good when he got to a certain they maybe moved into another area or something you know he knew but he found his place with you and it's possible for him to know that that's what he's supposed to do you know because i see yeah. the picture of him and he has that stare He's checking it out. Yeah, he has that <laughs> thing. Right. He's a beautiful dog. Leslie, you know, for the women in the military, do you have a message for them, the ones oh, that are serving God. now? This is, they're serving just just to, yes, be proud and be strong and, you know, and be beautiful because that is one thing looking back that that I just really take from, from my service is just be, again, be, be proud and and be beautiful. You can be a woman in the military and be strong and beautiful and to make sure you, you know, you value the experience because it will carry over after you're out of the military. And when you look back, 
you're really going to just say, wow, I did that, and just be just so proud of yourself. Thank you so much. This has been a woman's tenacity with Captain Leslie Smith, an amazing, amazing woman. Fourth of July, red, white, and blue, respect our military, give all the praise to the women that serve, and let's make sure that we remember Captain Leslie Smith and her co-star, Isaac. Service dogs need to be more respected as well because they have a big job. They have really a big job. And you see all types of dogs that are service dogs. It doesn't have to be a big dog. It has to be something that suits the person that they're with. And I believe that Isaac and Leslie are a, a set. So thank you so much, Captain Leslie Smith, for being on the Ladies' Night with Mommy Activists and Sons and Lady Tori, Tori Jones of Power 904. Thank you so much and have a good, good day. And I hope to hear more from you, Leslie, and I will share your bio everywhere. It's simply amazing. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. We enjoyed it, and it certainly was a pleasure for us to share our story. So thank you from the bottom of our hearts.